Remember these? Beanie babies. Oh, I'm looking for beanie babies. What's so attractive about them? I don't know. We got 10. We got five right here. We got 10 right there. 25. Cammy seems to get a thrill out of just hunting for them. I come here every day. Hi, honey. <laughs> <laughs> there has never been an obsession quite like beanie babies. And if you were a child, teen, or let's face it, an adult in the 90s, you can probably attest to this. Arriving on the scene in 1993 at the World Toy Fair in New York City, for $5, you could get a beanbag animal with names like Legs the Frog and Pinchers the Lobster. Beanie Babies were a new type of plush altogether. Instead of the typical stuffing that was inside most plushies, Beanie Babies were a combination of beans and stuffing. The beans being PVC pellets. Each beanie came with a heart-shaped hang tag that had the tie logo on the front in the animal's name and style number on the back. Consumers loved this new twist on the all too familiar stuffed animal, and they were collectible. But what everyone loved even more was the fact that someday, years down the road, our beloved Beanie Babies would be worth a small fortune. And the hysteria was real. Mail carriers were harassed, people went all in investing in them, Price guides were published yearly, and let's not forget this divorcing couple dividing up their beanie babies in court. Fun fact, Maple was the first to go. How could a simple child's toy represent both tender innocence and looming financial gain? In today's episode, we'll be taking a look at beanie babies, the lovable stuffed animals that grip the hearts and wallets of people all across the United States and Canada, and also the UK, but who's counting? In order to even talk about Beanie Babies, we have to talk about their creator, the elusive and private H. Ty Warner. Ty Warner was born on September 3rd, 1944 in Chicago, Illinois. The son of Harold and Georgia Warner he grew up in the suburbs of LaGrange. His father worked as a jeweler and toy salesman while his mother was a pianist. Five years after he was born, his parents would have one more child, a daughter they named Joyce. Growing up, Ty's relationship with his parents was strained and tenuous. His mother's behavior was often unstable and erratic. Ty's sister Joyce said that their mother would often stand in front of her mirror and scream at people who weren't there. In the late 70s, at Elgin Mental Hospital, she would be diagnosed with schizophrenia. Court filings show that Ty blamed his father for not taking a more active role in his mother's care, since she had gone years with an undiagnosed mental illness. Both Hal and Georgia were said to have been uninvolved and distant towards their kids, leading Ty and Joyce to become closer. Sadly, there have even been allegations made of molestation. Joyce claimed that when she was six years old, her father began abusing her, something Ty knew nothing about. From kindergarten to the age of 13, Ty attended Cossett Avenue Elementary School. At 14, he entered high school, but after just three semesters, his parents sent him to boarding school at St. John's Military Academy in Wisconsin. It was rumored that Ty and his friends had been stealing TVs and stereos. Worried that his son would end up in jail, Hal sent him north. While there, Ty joined the basketball, baseball, and football teams, and also became a member of the school's honor society. His sister said Ty hated being there and was often bullied. But his father never gave in, and Ty continued out the rest of his school years there. After graduating from St. John's in 1962, he enrolled at Kalamazoo College in Michigan later that fall. While there, he studied drama, but dropped out at the end of his freshman year, citing that he could no longer afford tuition. His sister and a former classmate say he had gotten a girl pregnant and brought her home to meet his father. Joyce claims that Hal paid the girl off and kicked Ty out. His love for theater didn't stop, and with nothing to lose, he decided to pursue acting and try his luck in Hollywood. He worked odd jobs to make ends meet, Bussing tables, parking cars, pumping gas, and going door-to-door -door selling encyclopedias. His big break in acting never came, though, and after five years, he left Los Angeles and returned home to Chicago. 
His father got him a job at Dakin Toy Company, where he worked as a sales representative for the Ohio region. The CEO of Dakin at the time recalled that Ty and his father's relationship seemed distant. He said, I had the feeling that it was hard for them to communicate. But if his home life was troubling him, it didn't show up on the job. Or maybe he was the type to throw himself into his work. Whatever the case, it worked. Ty was a great salesman, and before he knew it, he was earning a six-figure income. A massive achievement, especially at the time, considering that in the 60s, the median household income was less than $7,000, which really puts it into perspective just how much money Ty was making back then. Ty had a unique approach to his work. It was said that when meeting with customers, he showed up in a white Rolls Royce, wearing a fur coat, a top hat, and carrying a cane. Years later, in a 1996 interview with People magazine, Ty said, I figured if I was eccentric looking, people would think, what's he selling? One of his former co-workers at Dakin said, he wasn't particularly well-liked. He thought a lot of himself, let's put it that way. Ego, very much so. A few years after returning home in 1971, when Ty was 27, his parents officially divorced. In 1980, after Ty had been at Dakin for nearly 15 years, the company severed ties with him after the former CEO received a phone call from one of their customers, telling him that Ty was selling his own plushes while also selling for Dakin, a clear conflict of interest. After an investigation into the claims were proven true, Ty was let go from the company. This is when he packed his things and flew to Sorrento, Italy. A trip to visit friends turned into a three-year stay. I think that this is where he got his bearings together and figured out his next steps. Plus, he liked the slow pace of life in Italy. And while there, he got inspiration for his next big idea after coming across a line of plush cat toys unlike anything he'd seen in the United States. He said, I decided to come back and do something that no one has done. Make a good cat. In May of 1983, his 81-year-old father collapsed and died from a heart attack while playing tennis. This left Ty with a $50,000 inheritance, though it's been said he could have received even more. That, combined with a mortgage on his condo and his own personal savings, enabled him to launch Ty Inc. out of his condo in 1986. Soon after, he had his first creations, a line of Himalayan toy cats that he created in Korea. They had cutesy names like Angel, Smokey, Ginger, and Peaches. They sold for $20 and came complete with large, round eyes and beans in their paws. At an Atlanta toy fair, when he sold $30,000 worth of cats in an hour, Ty said, I knew I had a winner. Ty believed the popularity of his cats were due to a specific design decision he had made. Rather than overfill them with stuffing, he chose to underfill them with PVC pellets. And even though he was often criticized as being cheap for doing this, he said it gave them a lifelike quality that allowed them movement over traditional stiff plushies. Shortly after the launch of his toy cats, he moved into a 4,500 square foot home in the Oak Brook subdivision of Ginger Creek. His success continued, and by 1992, sales were at $6 million for the year. He had a bustling business with about 14 employees and was working on expanding his line of cats to include dogs, rabbits, and bears. In 1993, after believing that there were no quality toys in the $5 price range, he introduced the first Beanie Babies at the World Toy Fair in New York City. He made Beanie Babies much smaller than his line of toy cats, and he priced them reasonably. Ty initially launched with nine beanies, Legs the Frog, Squiller the Pig, Brownie the Bear, Flash the Dolphin, Splash the Whale, Patty the Platypus, Chocolate the Moose, Spot the Dog, and Pinchers the Lobster. Ty focused on selling to small, independent toy stores, preferring to have multiple small clients rather than a handful of larger ones. And he made it so that no store had them all. But they weren't as big of a hit as he'd hoped for. Still, in June of 1994, more than six months after launching Beanie Babies, he introduced 20 more, including Allie the Alligator, Digger the Crab, and Bones the Dog. Then, in early January of 1995, he released five new ones. He wasn't scrapping the idea just yet. Everything changed with a lamb named Lovey. Now, Lovey wasn't a Beanie Baby, 
but it was one of Thai Inc.'s traditional stuffed animals that sold well at hospital gift shops. In 1995, the company had to discontinue Lovey due to an issue with the fabric and their supplier in China, something that infuriated buyers. They weren't ready to see a product that sold so well in their stores go. After listening to some of his distributors, Ty's solution was to tell people that Lovey had been retired. And it worked. Buyers who were once upset about the discontinuation were now intrigued over its retirement. They wanted to know what other products were going to be retired. Well, Ty took that same concept and applied it to his Beanie Babies. That it was possible Beanie Babies would be retired as well, and that if they wanted to be safe, sellers should stock up on them while they still could. Ty's longtime girlfriend at the time, Faith McGowan, said, We would plant the seed in consumers' minds that the Beanie Babies they could buy on the primary market for $5 would be retired and immediately take on a higher value on the secondary market. So, in late 1995, Ty began to quietly market his products as collectibles. He didn't make any announcements or change the packaging. Rather, he had a sales team start telling retailers that certain products had been retired. And he started with Humphrey the Camel. Slither the Snake, Web the Spider, Peeking the Panda, and Trap the Mouse would follow soon after. By early 1996, after two years of poor sales for Beanie Babies, they finally started catching on and becoming popular with children, especially in the Midwest and around Thai Inc. headquarters in Oak Brook, Illinois. And because they were $5, kids could even buy the plushies themselves with their allowance money. Beanie Baby lovers began trading them in order to complete their collection, and teachers even had to ban them from classrooms due to how big of a distraction they had become. Retailers started to see an uptick in the number of kids coming in their stores asking about them. On December 9, 1995, J.T. Puffins, a toy store in Madison, Wisconsin, placed one of the first newspaper ads for them. Beanie Babies at Puffins. On December 6, we had 27 different styles of Beanie Babies. At only $5, they disappear quickly. Puffins, trying hard to be your Beanie Baby Boutique. 1996 saw the beginning of Beanie Baby's transition from children's toy to adult obsession. Progressing from something that kids were into to something that moms and dads did with their kids to adults collecting on their own. I think the girls really liked it at first, but now I think the adults have gotten into it, you know? <laughs> Much of the success of Beanie Babies came down to the small, independent mom-and-pop stores. Selling to them meant that Ty's sales reps could explain the concept of retired pieces to the store owners, the ones that were interacting with customers the most. Larger stores like Walmart and Toys R Us typically don't interact with their customers, and they certainly wouldn't take the time to explain about retired pieces. A gift store in Glenview, Illinois, called The Cat's Meow, started highlighting retired Beanie Babies for its customers. It was the first retailer to create a checklist of all the current and retired beanies. And by late 1996, there were 51 retired pieces that could no longer be bought in stores. At Toy Fair in February of 1996, Ty was offered $2 million for the Beanie Baby line. He sarcastically replied that he'd consider it for $100 million, a comedically astronomical amount to be sure. But what nobody knew at the time was that it would soon represent less than one month's sales. The biggest toy craze in history was about to begin. Each day they come to Hamilton Place Mall searching for these, Beanie Baby. The kids like them, so if it keeps them happy, that's why I buy them. You might be asking yourself, why beanies? What is it about them? To help answer that question, we need to look at the psychology of stuffed animals. For many of us, stuffed animals were beloved fixtures in our lives growing up. They offer a sense of companionship, security, and comfort. According to psychologists, stuffed animals can serve as transitional objects, providing ease and comfort during times of change especially as children progress from dependence to independence. They can also serve as a source of emotional support if a parent or loved one isn't nearby. But those concepts aren't limited to childhood. As human beings, we are constantly subjected to change, sometimes unwanted, not to mention stress, anxiety, and fear. In 2017, Build-A-Bear and Atomic Research found that 40% of adults still sleep with a stuffed animal. I'd be curious to know how many of you watching still sleep with one. 
The popularization of stuffed animals can be credited to a German woman named Marguerite Steiff. As a baby, she contracted polio, which left her legs paralyzed and the muscles in her right arm weakened. Despite all this, she went to sewing school and completed her training at age 17. She went on to become a seamstress and work alongside her sisters. Because sewing by hand presented difficulties due to her weakened muscles, in 1880, Marguerite bought a sewing machine. When she was introduced to the fabric felt, she loved how soft and warm it was. That's when she began making elephant-shaped pin cushions for friends and family. In December of 1880, she started selling them to the public, and they were a hit. By the 1890s, she was making dogs, lions, rabbits, and mice. The introduction of stuffed animals was a much-needed change to the toy industry. Up to that point, toys were hard. Think wood and rubber. And if they were stuffed, the material was coarse. By 1902, the Steiff Company started producing what would become the first stuffed bears. And by 1906, they had cemented their place in the world of toys. Stuffed animals seem to invoke something in us. They're symbols of comfort and security. It's no wonder these palm-sized beanie babies drew us in. And with a variety of different animals, there was something for everyone. The Beanie Baby checklist was another game changer for the line. One collector said, once you have a checklist, you don't look at what you have. You look at what you don't have. It couldn't have worked out more perfectly for Ty. Because they weren't popular when they first launched, Beanie Babies were produced in small quantities. This meant collectors had to hunt and trade for the ones they were missing. And they were willing to pay more for retired and hard-to-find pieces. Some of the biggest collectors in the Chicago area began compiling lists of all the retailers in the United States that sold Beanie Babies. They would call those stores and ask what beanies they had in stock. All they had to do was give their credit card numbers over the phone, and the Beanie Babies they wanted would be shipped directly to their home. And this was at a time when you had to pay for long-distance calls. Peggy Gallagher, a big collector at the time, admitted that she regularly racked up $1,000 a month in long-distance charges. Dedicated collectors in the Midwest were calling people they knew in other parts of the country, telling them to be on the lookout for certain pieces. Especially since the plushes hadn't quite caught on yet everywhere. It was essentially a big game of telephone. Thanks to word of mouth and the possibility of lucrative profits, Beanie Babies were gaining more and more momentum. By 1996, people had become so desperate to collect Beanie Babies that they were willing to pay anywhere from two to five times the going rate and then some. That's when Beanie Baby Flippers entered the market. Remember Humphrey the Camel, the first Beanie to be retired? By 1997, he was selling online for more than $2,000. Chili the Polar Bear was going for $1,800, Peking the Panda was going for $2,000, and Patty the Platypus was worth $800. So who was setting these insane prices? And how were secondary market prices being calculated for each Beanie? Well, would it shock you to learn that it wasn't Ty? It was the people doing the collecting. Big collectors like Peggy Gallagher were essentially setting prices based around hard-to-find pieces and listening to feedback from other collectors. You could even send her a self-addressed stamped envelope, and she'd send you a price list for all Beanie Babies. There was serious money to be made. People left their full-time jobs to become Beanie Traders. Eventually, the hunt grew from retired and hard-to-find pieces to collecting the anomalies. Some Beanie Babies had changes made to them in between production. For instance, Peanut the Elephant originally had royal blue fabric that was later switched to baby blue. If you could get your hands on a royal blue peanut, it was worth more than $5,000. Inky the Octopus was originally tan with no mouth. Then he was tan with a mouth. Then he was pink with a mouth. Anytime Ty changed a beanie, the older version immediately became sought after. And Ty was notorious for making changes because he constantly obsessed over every detail. With his first line of Himalayan cats, he was known to brush them, blow dry their fur, and pluck the stray hairs around their eyes. To him, the eyes were the most important part of any stuffed animal. He wanted them to look just right. Thai ink was generating between 8 and 10,000 packing slips daily. And during the holidays, it wasn't uncommon for the company to ship 15,000 orders a day to stores across the United States.
One of the real sleepers in the industry this year, these cute little animals called the Beanie Babies from an unknown company to called Thai Toys. Thai's winning recipe was working with a lot of small stores over large stores and keeping stock limited and dispersed between retailers. The last thing he wanted was to see his beanies piled up in bins. Thai's sales for 1996 were $280 million that year. You had this mega popular brand, and yet not a whole lot of news was coming down the pipeline from them. They didn't even do any advertising. Because the company didn't provide much info on its beanies, it again left big collectors to try and itemize the line themselves. Checklists were created, price sheets were produced, beanies were sorted, photographed, and hang tags were studied. The tags were categorized into different generations based on their design. There was definitely frustration from collectors over the lack of input from the company. But Ty Warner just wasn't interested in adding to or setting the record straight on any of the collector-created material. One former employee said that Ty thought they were nuts, and he wasn't interested in doing any interviews unless they were with Oprah or People magazine. Those around Ty said he was just too concerned with running day-to-day -day operations. He spent several months out of the year in China visiting his factories. Since the inception of his company, he was involved with nearly every part. In fact, Ty personally designed every piece the company put out. He selected each and every piece of fabric that went into more than 5,000 different plush animals sold. He visited gift and toy shops daily to make sure they were displaying his line the way he wanted. He also used these visits as a way to decide which beanies were going to be up next for retirement. If he noticed that a particular beanie wasn't selling too well, he'd announce its retirement. And once a beanie was announced as retiring, the company immediately stopped shipping them to stores and canceled all outstanding orders. As you can imagine, this created fear for collectors. We started lining up at 1.30 in the afternoon yesterday for our 8 o'clock sale, so they waited about 18 and a half hours. In their eyes, no beanie was off limits. The only sure way to guarantee you get them is to collect them as fast as possible. And here's the thing. It didn't matter if the company had 50,000 retired beanies in stock. They still wouldn't sell them. Instead, they went to a warehouse where they were dismantled and sold back to factories in China. Because Tai wouldn't give out any information on his beanies, it often left the media to consult with expert collectors to field questions and give projections about the future of beanies and upcoming retirements. There's 475 of these made, signed and numbered, to his employees. This was something Ty Warner didn't appreciate, and he was tired of collectors creating materials using his merchandise and profiting off of it. If only there was a way to connect and communicate with his growing fan base. They could get their information directly from the source, receive regular updates, and connect with other beanie enthusiasts. Luckily for him, there was. It's easy to install and easy to get started. Everyone I know is on it. Email, <laughs> instant messages. There's no better way to keep in touch. You've got mail. Just three years earlier, in 1993, the World Wide Web launched for public domain. But just like many other companies, Thai Inc. wasn't utilizing it yet. In 1992, Lena Trivedi, a 19-year-old sociology major, answered an ad for a telemarketer position at Thai Inc. She became the company's 12th employee. Her first year was spent calling stores that had placed orders from the company but weren't within the sales force territory for them to make regular contact with. Lena's honest feedback to Thai about his ideas even the bad ones, was something Ty appreciated. Soon, she was attending trade shows and setting up their booths. She presented her own ideas to Ty too, and he loved them. When she told him she thought the inside of the tags, which at the time said to and from, were boring, he listened. Lena's suggestion was to add birthdays and poems to each beanie. Her first mock-up was for Stripes the Tiger. Stripes was never fierce nor strong, so with tigers, he didn't get along. Jungle life was hard getting by, so he came to his friends at Thai. And his birthday was June 11, 1995, the year he was introduced. And Thai immediately loved it. The birthdays and poems gave each of his beanies a little bit of personality and character. He wanted her to write a poem for every beanie in the collection, which at the time was 86. 
In late 1995, Lena came to Thai with her biggest idea yet, to create a website. An idea that was about to change the company's future and take Thai's wealth to a whole nother level. In 1995, about 14% of Americans were online, roughly 18 million homes. Millions of Americans own a personal computer. If you're one of them, you can now glimpse the future with nothing more than a modem, a phone line, and a few dollars a month. Well, it's very hip to be on the internet right now. Lena brought her school-provided dial-up modem to the office with her and showed Ty all the Beanie Baby message boards that were popping up. He was hooked and soon had web TV installed in both his home and office. When Lena threw it out there that she believed she could create a website for the company, Ty gave her the green light and told her to go for it. First, they had to obtain a domain name. Ty would end up paying $150,000 to a man in California who had already bought Ty.com for the rights to the domain. Because Ty, who was generally adverse to spending money like that, was so willing to do so, it showed just how valuable he thought it would be for his business. Once they had a domain name, the next step was figuring out what the competition was doing. And surprisingly, not much. Their websites were more so corporate, containing basic contact information and product lineups. Ty was looking for something consumer friendly. And in order for it to work, it had to be something that kept people coming back. They wanted to be the voice that was providing information and official resources, not the collectors. By mid-1996, the site was up and running. Hangtag started displaying the company URL, saying visit our website, www.tie.com. They were actually one of the first companies to display their URL on their products. One of their first concepts was the info beanie. Every month, tie.com users voted on which beanie baby they wanted to be their source of information. Every few hours, updates in the voice of that animal would be uploaded to the site. News about what was going on at the company, hints about new products, and clues as to what beanie might be retired next. This couldn't have worked out better for both the company and consumers. Collectors were going out and buying certain Beanie Babies based on the information they were given, rather than waiting for the official announcement. Lena said, We were able to use that voice to kind of manipulate the market, so to speak. A simple, ambiguous message from the Info Beanie could kick off a buying frenzy. They're here! They're here. The latest shipment came in around 2 o'clock. They were nearly sold out an hour later. But for those who showed up here two hours before their arrival, it was well worth the wait. In Redline, York County, Ron Martin, News 8. The busiest part of the website was the guest book. Messages were popping up left and right with requests to buy, sell, and trade beanies. It wasn't uncommon to see messages like, I have stretch and prance. I need maple. If you have maple and don't have stretch or prance, email me and we can trade. On January 1st, 1997, Ty Inc. shook things up and posted an announcement listing nine beanies that were being retired. The notice came in the form of a 40-minute long shockwave animation featuring Kiwi the Toucan performing a magic show. The one thing Ty didn't take into account was bandwidth. Visitors to the site were trying to load the animation, which rendered the site unusable for most of the day, leaving fans frustrated and unsure about what was going on. Some users had to download Shockwave in order to view it, which took forever on dial-up. Is anybody else getting flashbacks to when you'd spend an entire day using LimeWire to download one song? I mean, I never did that. Sorry. The announcement was a huge success. Website traffic increased 3,500% in one day. Using that same tactic, on March 19, 1997, the vice president of Thai Inc. appeared on the Today Show, announcing that a new beanie was being released. And the only way to find out what it was, was to head to the website. It was also in March of 1997 that Thai began limiting retailers to being able to order just 36 of each beanie per month. Something stores couldn't believe, as they were willing to order them in bulk. Thai did this for two main reasons. The first being he was having supply issues, and the second being he wanted to control the fad. 
former employee said he was constantly talking about controlling the fad. He had been in the industry long enough to know that once supply met up with demand, the craze would be over. He wanted to keep consumers and retailers on their feet. They'd even tell stores that their orders were on their way, when in reality, Thai Inc. knew they wouldn't be shipping them for another month and a half. They were kind of to the point where they didn't want their Beanie Babies to be found too easily. It made people have to hunt. One of their biggest accounts, Noodle Kadoodle, would even visit Thai Inc. headquarters, try to wine and dine the staff, and just flat out beg for Beanie Babies. It didn't work. Beanie Baby hunters were desperate. They'd call stores, line up outside them, and even scout UPS trucks. It got so bad that in 1998, Thai had to remove their heart logo from their shipping boxes. Some retailers stopped carrying the line altogether, with one stating, We had shipping issues, there was a lack of communication, we couldn't get questions answered about invoices, and we were totally ignored. Not that Thai Inc. cared much. Beanie Babies were so popular, retails could complain all they liked. At the end of the day, if they wanted the sought-after plushes in their stores, they had to deal with less-than-ideal conditions. Especially because Beanie Babies made up the majority of their sales. In mid-1996, McDonald's approached Ty about a Happy Meal and Beanie Baby collaboration. Up to this point, Ty had turned down any type of collaboration. Mattel wanted to do a Barbie and Beanie Baby collab. Ty said no. Steven Spielberg wanted to use beanies in his movies. Ty said no. He also turned down working with cereal companies, clothing companies, and book publishers. At one point, he even had the green light for a Beanie Baby TV show. Toys like He-Man and My Little Pony had become massively successful thanks to product-based TV shows that coincided with their releases. My Little Pony Tales. Ultimately, Ty Warner would shut down the idea of a TV show, too. He was concerned that giving his Beanie Babies fully developed personalities would hinder children's abilities to be creative with them. But when McDonald's came calling, Ty couldn't say no. They pitched him the idea of Teeny Beanies, a miniature version of the beloved Beanie Baby. Ty felt that McDonald's could offer him something that no one else could, a different class of consumers. You see, Beanie Babies were primarily sold in specialty stores and gift shops, which meant that their buyers were primarily middle and upper class. But McDonald's could expose lower-income consumers to Thai products. The Beanie Baby and Happy Meal promotion was a huge success. First I got Pinky, then I got Pinky. I got Pinky and Patty in the same week. One's in each $1.99 hamburger Happy Meal you buy your kids. That deal would bag Thai Inc. more than $100 million. With the mass promotion of Teeny Beanies by McDonald's, stores like Toys R Us attempted to get in on Beanie Babies again. But Ty still wouldn't budge for them. We think he's making a mistake. We're America's toy store. Why not have your product in our stores? On April 11th, 1997, Teeny Beanies launched at McDonald's stores nationwide. The series included 10 beanies, Patty the Platypus, Pinky the Flamingo, Chops the Lamb, Chocolate the Moose, Goldie the Goldfish, Speedy the Turtle, Seymour the Seal, Snort the Bull, Quacks the Duck, and Liz the Lizard. Customers went crazy. McDonald's stores were fielding up to 50 calls an hour from people wanting to know if they had Beanie Babies in stock, which ones they had, and when they'd start selling them. Patrons were ordering up to $100 worth of Happy Meals and telling cashiers to just keep the food. Beanie Baby this, Beanie Baby. And they're not only ordering like two or three, they're ordering like 10, 15, 20. Um, this is our fourth McDonald's. Eventually, the fast food chain had to set up daily automated recordings listing which beanies they had. When the restaurant had to impose a per-customer limit, collectors got creative and started wearing disguises and swapping vehicles. One McDonald's employee in Florida got arrested for stealing $6,000 worth of teeny beanies and reselling them. 100 million teeny beanie babies were made for the campaign. McDonald's predicted there would be enough to sell one to every household in America within the first few weeks. But two weeks into a planned five-week promotion, McDonald's had run out of product. 
Lynn Lister drove three hours to a McDonald's in Chicago after the McDonald's in her town ran out of teeny beanies. They were sold out within two hours. There's not been a Beanie Baby on sale in Bloomington since last Friday. When McDonald's launched its teeny beanie promotion, the company was confident it could meet demand, boasting it had made 100 million of the teeny beanies to last through the end of May. Now, McDonald's says they'll be lucky if the teeny beanies last another week. It's a marketing coup. It causes some headaches, but uh, for the most part, it's, it's just pretty phenomenal. Publicity surrounding the beanie shortage is a dream come true for McDonald's. But ultimately, it could backfire on McDonald's efforts to reconnect with kids. They drive through that drive-up lane and they say, I'm sorry, we have no teeny beanie babies. You're going to have some very disappointed uh, children. A former McDonald's executive said it really created a frenzy. The customers were deranged. McDonald's employees were even given pins that said, I survived the attack of teeny beanie babies. Shipments were even given police escorts to prevent them from being stolen. Everybody wanted to get their hands on these teeny beanies. Oxford Bank of Chicago even bought a thousand teenies on the secondary market in order to get people to come in and try to open up savings accounts with them. Media coverage of Beanie Babies skyrocketed. The McDonald's promotion even created pandemonium in Canada, with monthly sales going from $1 million to $7 million. With the success of the McDonald's promotion bringing in new collectors, Ty decided to partner with one other corporation, Major League Baseball. On May 18th, just three days after the McDonald's promo had ended, the Chicago Cubs hosted a special event, a Beanie Baby giveaway, where Cubby the Bear was given to the first 10,000 kids. It was the first sellout game the team had had in a while. As Ty Inc. outgrew its facilities, they broke ground on a new $14 million, 75,000 square foot building that was to become their new headquarters. And just like before, it remained hidden. No logo, no signage, no address listed. In 1998, a USA Weekend poll found that 64% of Americans owned at least one Beanie Baby. And the second McDonald's giveaway that year was even more successful than the first. The following is in code to avoid panic in the streets. Eeny Tay, Eeny Bay, Abies Bay are at bay at McDonald's May. There's one teeny Beanie Baby in each McDonald's Happy Meal you buy. <laughs> this time the series included 12. Doby the Doberman, Bongo the Monkey, Twigs the Giraffe, Inch the Inchworm, Pinchers the Lobster, Happy the Hippo, Mel the Koala, Scoop the Pelican, Bones the Dog, Zip the Cat, Waddles the Penguin, and Peanut the Elephant. With the rise of the secondary market taking things too far and making his beanies unaffordable for kids, Ty Warner started cracking down on retailers who weren't staying in the $5 price point. He even set up a hotline for consumers to report price gouging. Beanies that were supposed to be selling for $5 were going for $35 on the secondary market in 1996. And by 1997, those same beanies were going for anywhere between $50 and $70. 1998 also saw the rise in counterfeit Beanie Babies. Don't be fooled, these are not the real thing. U.S. Customs officers at O'Hare confiscated over 400 fake Beanie Babies. We suspected that there may be narcotics in it. When the inspectors opened the boxes, lo and behold, stuffed animals. Big collectors started offering to authenticate them by mail for $20 each. Tags were shorter, and there was also a lot of punctuation mistakes inside the tag. If you're thinking that's outrageous and nobody would pay that, you'd be wrong. It was netting Peggy Gallagher a six-figure income back then. Ty's sales for that year came in at $1.4 billion. And yes, that's billion with a B. But signs of a slowdown came in January of 1999, when the newest retired pieces didn't fetch the prices that they were predicted to. Thanks to eBay, collectors could now find the missing pieces to their collections more easily and it made prices more transparent, since you could see them in real time. This effectively made published price guides obsolete. For the first time since 1993, supply was starting to catch up with demand, and the notion of beanies being a long-term investment began to fall apart. On January 1st, 1999, Ty released 24 new Beanie Babies. 
the largest release in the company's history. Some say this was a fatal mistake, as it overwhelmed buyers. You see, when it comes to collectibles, most collectors want to be able to get a complete set, but the sheer size of the Beanie Baby line was getting out of control. People had whole rooms dedicated to their beanie collections. They weren't as easy to store as something like baseball cards. Thai shipments for January were down by 20% compared to the previous year. Six years ago, these tiny toys hit the stores and sales now are sagging, values are plunging, and collectors are concerned. And with some retail stores trying to charge $30 to $40 for beanies, it was souring customers. Thai Inc. was buying Beanie Babies from overseas factories from anywhere from 25 to 65 cents apiece. They sold them to retailers for $2.50, who were then supposed to turn around and sell them to customers for $5 each. But some of them weren't. And with more than 10,000 stores carrying the line, policing them was impossible. The unpopular ones that hadn't been retired yet were selling below retail. Collectors weren't happy. Claudia Dunn, an early collector, said, I don't know why Warner decided to flood the market and kill it, instead of limiting the number like he did before. Another big collector, Mary Beth Sobolewski, wrote, There are simply too many Beanie Babies on store shelves everywhere. Warner knew the Beanie Baby craze was coming to an end. And behind the scenes, he already had a backup plan in mind. He was going to retire Beanie Babies and come out with a new line. In January of 2000, he had plans to introduce Beanie Kids, but the prototype didn't go over well with retailers. He shelved that idea and came up with a whole new plan. On Tuesday, August 31st, 1999, fans logged onto Thai.com to a cryptic message. Very important notice. On December 31st, 1999, at 11.59 p.m., all Beanies will be retired, including one of the new pieces named The End a black bear beanie with fireworks on his chest. A web posting by the Thai Corporation makes it very clear that Beanie Babies will be a thing of the past come December 31st. His plan worked, kind of. Traffic to the site skyrocketed. Beanie Baby bidding shot up 75% in one day. I think it's very, very sad. Well, I think it's really bad. And it's sad. I'm happy. I'm gonna get a lot of money now. And then the company went silent. Until December 25th, when it posted, After much thought, I am willing to put the fate of Beanie Babies in your hands. You make the decision. He then announced that fans had 48 hours in which they could pay 50 cents to vote on if Beanie Babies should continue or not. The proceeds would be going to the Elizabeth Glasser Pediatric AIDS Foundation. On January 2nd, 2000, at 6 a.m., the polls closed and the votes cast were in favor of keeping Beanie Babies, with 91% of the 209,000 votes backing Beanies. Drum roll, please. <laughs> it was announced that the toys will continue to hit the stores. Sources close to Ty claim that Ty had essentially padded the votes. There is some evidence to support this, because news of Beanie Babies coming back were basically met with shoulder shrugs. Most Beanie Baby collectors and dealers agree that things were over back in August of 1999, when Ty announced that they would all be retired. On January 5th, 2000, Ty announced the release of 71 new products, including 31 Beanie Buddies, 12 Attic Treasures, and 21 Ty Classics. Three days later, he announced the Beanie Kids. They were met with less than stellar reviews, mainly because people thought they were creepy. Then, on March 1st, the company released 20 new Beanie Babies. But sales only continued to decline. By November of 2000, Beanies were popping up in dollar stores. And once this happened, everybody knew it was officially over. In 2004, Ty claimed losses of more than $39 million on his tax returns. And Beanie Babies were being bought for 40 cents each, and then being sold to carnivals and claw machine operators something Ty Warner basically had no control over. The Beanie Baby craze was this perfect mixture of an era that was still into collectibles, an affordable, cute product, scarcity tactics, using small stores, and jumping onto the internet at the perfect time. 
But the Beanie Baby bubble couldn't last forever. In 2013, Ty Warner was arrested for tax evasion, for keeping over $100 million in a secret Swiss bank account to avoid paying taxes on it. He ended up paying a $53.5 million civil judgment and was sentenced to two years probation and 500 hours of community service. Beanie Babies and Ty Inc. are still around today, though there isn't the same frenzy surrounding them. Even over the last few years, thousands of videos about Beanie Babies still get uploaded to YouTube. I want to hear from you. Did you collect Beanie Babies back in the 90s and early 2000s? If not Beanie Babies, was it Precious Moments, Pogs, Hot Wheels? Let me know. Researching Beanie Babies has me low-key wanting them to come back. I remember collecting them with my mom and it was so fun. If you enjoyed today's video, give it a thumbs up and hey, while you're at it, consider subscribing to the channel so you don't miss out on the next investigation. Now I'm off to eBay. I got a bit on some Beanie Babies. <laughs>